Welcome to the Relive Video Podcast from Dementia Researcher and I Start. So hi everyone and thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm Beth Eyre and I'm a PhD researcher um, at the University of Sheffield. Um, I'm the student postdoc executive committee member of the Vascular Cognitive Disorders PIA. Um, and today I'm delighted to be talking with Dr. Dave Cash. Um, hi Dave, um, so Hello. welcome. Very excited Thank to have you, you here. Great to be um, here. Thank you. So could we, I start by asking you to kind of introduce yourself um, and tell us which PIA you're involved with. Yeah, uh, my name is Dave Cash, as, as we've just <laughs> discussed. I'm uh, at the uh, UCL Dementia Research Center at the Queen Square Institute of Neurology. Uh, and uh, I've been involved with the neuroimaging PIA for a little over two years now. So I, I am I started as as education chair, and uh, this year I'm vice chair. And as we flip through AIC, uh, I'll become the chair of the neuroimaging PIA um, just after AIC ends. That's exciting to be talking with the uh, incoming chair. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's it was. I have to admit, like there were many years when I would kind of attend the neuroimaging PIA meeting and it seemed like there were so many rock stars who were who were kind of leading the committee and doing all this and I'm like how, how in the world will I ever you know make it in there and in fact I I put my name forth one time and I looked at the list of competitors uh for for the position I put myself on oh, no chance but uh the second time around it, it worked and I and I got uh, voted education here it's been it's been a lot of fun the last two years met a lot of great people and made a lot of new friends it's really cool that you've done like a number of roles um, within the executive committee. Um, it's kind of something must be good for you to kind of stick around, right? Well, yeah, yes, but <laughs> um, the way that the neuroimaging PIA uh, committee works is if you go to education, you go to vice chair and then chair and then past chair. So uh, I won one election, but I don't know if I would have won <laughs> three more if that was the case. But I, I really think it's a good idea. I know a lot of PIAs do this where they kind of have people looped in as a progression to kind of keep handover really and continuity really good. And, and it definitely has worked in our case. I've, I've really um, learned a lot from the, the two chairs, the past chairs I've been interacting with, um, but, well, three. So, so Betty Times was the past chair when I came in and I've got to work with Renaud Lechois for a couple of years and that's been a lot of fun. And uh, Laura Vissa, uh, who's, who's now at Lund University, has just been such a great help. She's put so much really nice structure down uh, that I just take a lot of what she does and uh, do it again. And I look like I'm doing something rather competent when it's really uh, a lot. A lot of it's been down to Laura's excellent organization and, and set up. That's awesome. Um, it's really exciting to kind of hear a little bit about the the peer, but I'd kind of like to, and I'm sure the listeners would also let us know a little bit about like yourself and your research. So what is kind of like your research area and then um, kind of how did you come into dementia research, I guess? Yeah, so um, my research uh, primarily centers around uh, imaging biomarkers, uh, mainly structural MR, uh, diffusion weighted MRI and, and various forms of PET and particularly in the preclinical stage of Alzheimer's disease, where there are no obvious or apparent symptoms, uh, but there is evidence of underlying pathology. Um, and, and here at UCL, we use uh, a few studies for that. So we work a lot with the, uh, the worldwide dominantly inherited Alzheimer network, um, where UCL is both a site, and we also do various um, research and analysis with the data collected across the, the entire world. Um, John Rohr here at UCL runs a, a similar study called the Genetic FTD Initiative, or GenFi, um, and that's a similar cohort involving uh, genetic forms of frontotemporal dementia, and that has sites all across Europe uh, and Canada. And uh, finally, more on the sporadic late onset form of disease, uh, another neurologist here at UCL, John Schott, uh, has worked closely with the National Survey on Health and Development. Uh, to do the first neuroimaging study of this 1946 uh, birth cohort. So this is a really exciting cohort to work with. It's all individuals born from all over Great Britain uh, within one week of each other in March 1946. So uh, our standard deviations of our age demographics are remarkably low in that study. Um, and we've now scanned over well over 600 non-impaired participants as part of this study. 
We have lots of different um, MRI modalities and, and PET modalities. Um, and amongst those studies, what I particularly focus on is, is longitudinal changes, tracking longitudinal changes within a patient over time, uh, particularly how we can use that information for, for, uh, from these studies to think about how we can design clinical trials better, um, use them as endpoints in, in clinical trials. Because if we can make clinical trials as efficient as possible, we can make decisions quicker. If, it, if the drug's clearly not going to work, we can stop putting all that time and investment on that and, and all the disappointment that will lead into. Um, but also, when we find drugs that are successful, like we've had with recent therapies, uh, maybe we can get these drugs um, through the approval process um, with the same robust statistical evidence, um, but get them to patients sooner. Um, as for how I got into dementia research, actually, my, my first foray into it really was, a, was, I would say, was a bit of a failure. Um, I came from the States uh, to do a postdoc, and it was far more about novel image processing methods for segmentation and, and analysis, and it just, it just wasn't a good fit for my skills. Um, but fortunately, I had two supervisors at the time who were founding a, a company on how to provide imaging analysis for clinical trials. So they spun this company out, and I moved over there and worked uh, at that company for about five years. And, and there's where I really found my, my love for dementia research and, and what I wanted to do. So I, I was setting up imaging trials with uh, AD trials in particular, um, understanding all the issues about what evidence was gonna be needed to, to gain approval for a drug, uh, the challenges with coming, running multi-slide AD trials that involved imaging, um, and just think the incredible massive impact a successful drug was gonna have. Um, so I was, I realized that, yeah, this is the sort of area I want to work in, like this kind of space. And um, I was really fortunate that I, as part of my, my first postdoc and, and at the company, I had a lot of time to, to interact with uh, Nick Fox and, and Sebastian Orsalem. And uh, there's an opportunity to come back and kind of work between the Dementia Research Center and a, and a group of computer scientists and medical physicists at UCL called the Center for Medical Image Computing where I was trying to work about how we could get these really great discoveries in machine learning algorithms for, for imaging uh, implemented over into clinical research. So that, that was my journey. It's, it's not the sort of conventional kind of postdoc to, to investigator route that, that tends to be uh, the, the story. I think it's interesting because I think a lot of people now just don't have that conventional route in. And I think yeah. it's important for people to hear that anyone who's interested in your peer or the peer that I'm part of is you don't have to kind of have that straight linear direct route in. There's lots of different ways you can get into and get to the stage that you're at. So that's super exciting. Um, so kind of just to follow on that, you sound like you've worked on lots of different studies. Um, do you have like a favorite study? And if you do have a favorite, can you tell me why? <laughs> Oh my goodness! It's like asking to pick between children, um, <laughs> I, especially because um, I think I can, add, you know, just like with with uh, children, I can pick out particular things that I like best about them. Um, so, uh, you know, I was I was involved uh, on the ground floor with uh, Genfi and and forty six. So the Genfi's um, study. I did a lot of effort really setting up both the, the data capture and the, the data collection. Um, with the 46 study, we use a, a combined PET-MR scanner, which is um, a very interesting device, but it, it comes with its own logistical challenges and, and things like that. So uh, it's been really fun figuring out how we can make the most use of that scanner um, and the data we're collecting on it. And Diane was the first study that I came back to the DRC to work on. And I've been involved with that one, you know, pretty much since I began here. So um, I guess you could say that's the oldest child in, in, the, um, in the analogy. So uh, I would say that those three are probably my favorite studies because I work the most with, with those um, day in and day out. But yeah, there have been other studies along the way that I've, I've had time. Those are other people's kids. Um, <laughs> nice enough, just not mine. So I know you've already kind of mentioned some of the, the work that you've done, but what, like in your research field, um, what are some of the hot topics and more, most exciting areas in the field at the moment? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. And uh, because we have so many tools to work with, we, we have a, a lot going on with imaging. Um, I think 
first off, I'd, I'd talk about since we're able to capture a three-dimensional image uh, of the brain at various stages of the disease, um, it's being really investigated lots of different modalities at the same time to understand sort of spatial heterogeneity, vulnerability of, of the disease process, which brain barriers are more vulnerable than areas. Um, and we have a lot of uh, data-driven disease progression modeling techniques uh, available now, like uh, the SUSTAIN model created here at UCL by Alex Young and, and Neil Oxtoby. And what that does is it can identify sort of separate clusters of how the disease progression looks. So some people may have a, to, to take your PA, may have a vascular element early on uh, in the disease. Other people may have, um, you know, more medial temporal involvement. And um, this has really taken off the world to characterize heterogeneity of imaging patterns uh, in, in lots of different uh, uh, populations and with lots of different modalities. Um, kind of related to that is the, the ability to see uh, these three-dimensional maps, uh, how, look at how different brain regions are connected uh, through, you know, functional connectivity or, or uh, structural connectivity uh, and see what that tells us, uh, combining that with PET to see what that tells us about sort of the, the start and the spread of pathology over time. Um, I personally am really excited about all the work going on around novel PET tracers, uh, what additional information they can provide on other aspects like uh, neuroinflammation uh, synaptic density, but um, someday hopefully other pathologies like TDP or alpha synuclein. Um, there's some really, you know, I, I, sometimes structural MRI gets sort of like put off to the side. We've been there, done that. But I think actually there's there's a there's a whole lot of exciting work in structural MRI, kind of hitting it on both on two fronts. So on the one hand, we have the, a lot of new AI-driven methods to make imaging more accessible. So we have these ultra-fast MRI scanning protocols. Uh, that can give us a, a complete structural workup in about six to seven minutes rather than the sort of conventional 30 minute uh, protocol. Um, and we also have these ultra low field MRI machines being produced um, where we can get scanners to participants in locations all around the world we've never uh, had access uh, to before. But if we go the other way and we look at some of the ultra high field 7T MRI, we're getting really lovely high resolution quantitative imaging that allows us to better visualize, you know, cortical layers, substructures of the regions like the hippocampus, the thalamus, the amygdala, as well as like really tiny structures like the locus coryllus, which has been a place that people have been investigating a lot recently. Um, it's such deep data that uh, AI and deep learning are almost like a um, integral part now. Um, and where I feel like those things have had real success, particularly deep learning, is um, making processes that took a lot of time um, to run, where we have a load of training data that we can really speed up the whole uh, analysis pipelines uh, much quicker. So um, I think those are sort of like a whistle stop tour of, of the various things that I'm excited about in, in the imaging field. So, I mean, I heard you mention something to do with the vascular stuff. Obviously, I love the vasculature. So what do you think at the moment is kind of the best imaging modality to kind of give us a bit more insight into vascular changes happening in um in, in preclinical um stages or at least like later on stages in alzheimer's disease you know one of the, the first things especially from a research perspective is being able to have sort of more volumetric uh, measures that that we can see um, better resolve things like white matter hyperintensities, the cunes, uh, paravascular spaces, um, things like that. But there are also, uh, you know, um, I think arterial spin labelings come a long way recently um, for, uh, you know, adni 4s looking to, to, to roll out like a, a multi-label ASL so that we can actually get um, information about um, uh, transit times and uh, sort of the flow there. Um, I think also, you know, there's been a, a fair amount of people looking at, you know, repurposing the, the early part or, or a full dynamic PET scan. In, in some cases, like some of the amyloid tracers, you can get some really nice information about blood flow and, and blood perfusion from those things. Uh, and um, I think the other thing that I've really been interested in looking at is some of the, um, the 40 flow, uh, techniques that are coming out of Wisconsin and other places where we can get a bit more information about uh, about the blood flow itself rather than this sort of secondary proxy information. So, uh, you know, with some of these things, 
um, they have a lot of promise, but when we're talking about preclinical and the signal being so small, uh, I, I'd probably err on the caution of something that may not pick up the earliest signs of things, but also would have maybe less variability, like in, intra-person variability that, that makes you wonder, okay, am I really seeing this or is this just some kind of um, unique signal? But that's also with me with my longitudinal hat on where I'm always thinking about, you know, with cross-sectional, it's easier to see a big signal even with that variability, but with longitudinal, we're talking about really small but sensitive changes in, in some of these measures. And as a result, I'm really worried about how much measurement from, from time point to time point is there so that we can pick up those, those changes reliably. I think talking about kind of that variability, um, I remember when I started collecting data and I was so surprised how variable um, like the data was from person to person. And I don't, I don't really, I don't know why I didn't expect that, but I found that really surprising, like the differences in responses. And I think that variability is actually really interesting sometimes to kind of look at the data because sometimes we kind of like average, don't we? And we kind of like just get, get rid of that variability. But actually that's, I think with things like with neurodegenerative diseases, that variability could be really, really important um, to kind of explain things and kind of help us understand more what's going on. So that's really interesting. So obviously you've already kind of mentioned your peer, but how does the work of your specific peer, the neuroimaging peer, how does that support like your whole field of research? So I think uh, particularly since the pandemic, our research, our peers focused a lot on education. So, you know, we used to do a, a big tutorial at AIC that kind of covered the basics of, of what neuroimaging does. Um, and when we weren't meeting in person for those couple of years, um, Renault and some of the other PM members said, well, let's just turn these into webinars and, and start offering these as webinars. And they were really, really successful. So we have done a range of um, webinars over the years. I think um, we, we hit double digits most years. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, been a, it's been a lot recently, even though I'm sure people are, are a little bit tired of, of, of Zoom and webinars at this point. Uh, but we, they cover all the way from some of these more basic um, discussions on what structural or PET imaging is um, to more um, advanced uh, research, uh, you know, summary webinars on, say, structural, you know, on, on connectivity, on, you know, novel uh, MRI sequences, novel PET tracers, deep, uh, big data, things like that. So we, we try and run all, all across the gambit. And we've also been trying our hardest to make sure other researchers around the world are included. So we've had a, uh, a couple uh, imaging webinars in Spanish. Um, we really have a lot of help there from uh, Yakil K. Rotz over in, in Harvard to help set that up. Um, Eduardo Zimmer helped us set up a, a webinar in Portuguese, primarily aimed at um, Brazilian researchers and, and other Portuguese speaking researchers. And uh, Mara Malpetti and, and Martina Bocchetta helped us set up an Italian uh, one recently. So we're trying to make sure that we're trying to get um, webinars in other languages and provide the educational aspect, not just uh, in England, in English. Um, uh, of course, our, we do a lot with our uh, Alzheimer's Image Consortium pre-conference. So we have over 500 people researched there. We're trying to really differentiate that from the main AIC session uh, because there's a lot of imaging just throughout the AIC as well. And what we're trying to aim for is what are the new directions? Where, where are we going with imaging? Uh, what, what's new and different? It might not be so highlighted in the main session. It might be a bit more technical. You know, what are the new methods that are, are coming out and, and that people are using to, to analyze the data? Um, and in that, we really try and give preference to PhD early career researchers so that they have a, a platform to speak on this day. Um, and besides that, I think we try our hardest to recognize uh, the best papers in the field. So we have the Moni de Leon uh, prize for the best papers in neuroimaging. So those are really prestigious, um, big money uh, awards uh, that um, we get about 15 to 20 nominations uh, over the year. We have a we have a whole panel look over them, uh, and and try and decide which are which are the best senior scientists, junior scientists, and uh, training papers. And um, I think those are really prestigious, and people have really uh, talked about how how much of a milestone that was for them when they, when they got those awards. So uh, continuing to just um, help encourage people to submit papers to that, solicit nominations, have a really good 
uh, competitive process so that people can really feel that they've, they've earned a, a, a well-deserved award when they get it. It sounds like you're a very um, kind of active peer. Uh, it sounds like you do a lot of things. Um, and it's really nice to hear about the education side because I guess neuroimaging can be quite hard to get into because like the tools are so expensive. Like you may not be able to, you may, your university may not have access to some of those tools um, and you may be analyzing data as part of your project and things like that. So I think having those education webinars um, kind of explaining those like fundamental building blocks of what you do is is super exciting, and it's nice to hear that you're doing it in lots of different languages as well. Um, yeah, just to uh, just to, to add on to that point, something else we've started beginning to do is we know there's a big gap between talking about what a, a neuroimaging uh, analysis looks like and actually doing one. So last year we started a, uh, an immersive workshop on the Friday before AIC where we're just giving people an opportunity to work with some of these uh, imaging packages. So it was a four hour thing. And what we did was we didn't want people, um, we wanted to be rather equitable of a process so that everybody felt that they were getting the same experience. So we, we didn't want somebody who uh, may have come from a big university with a prestigious grant and like some kind of super powered uh, desktop replacement to have a, a different experience than somebody who may have a six year old laptop. So. Uh, we put um, a bunch of virtual machines on the cloud uh, so that everybody accessed them through the internet and we ran all the tutorials uh, through that. So nobody had to worry about, oh, how do I install SPM or MATLAB or I'm not allowed to have MATLAB on my machine? Um, uh, how do I do this free server thing? And we, 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 we gave a various like very taster sessions of, of structural MRI diffusion and functional, but you're right, it's like, um, just getting involved with command line, which is such an important part of, of neurogen imaging analysis and, and how to find and install some of these um, you know, novel packages that may not be expensive, but uh, from a monetary perspective, but ex expensive from a, a personal investment of time and to ha you know, learning how to do you know, R or Python uh, stuff um, it is an entry barrier. And we're trying to figure out how we can sort of slowly make that imaging bar that barrier you know, attack it in parts, if you will. It sounds like as a peer, you're really trying to, to do that. And that's, that's really exciting. And I think that's really good for obviously with iStart and the new where students um, get free um, registration to the peers. Um, I think that's really exciting because then from like an earlier stage, you can maybe start looking into these things that you're interested in and it's accessible from that earlier age, which is nice. Um, Cause if you're like a first year undergrad, that sounds accessible at least to be interested in it and then start early on rather than it being at like PhD level um, or like master's level. So that's really exciting. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about your committee and kind of how it's all organized? So the, the, the PIA itself, I think it, it, it's, it's, I'm not sure exactly when the PIA itself was found, uh, founded in the midst of times, but it's been going on for a pretty long time because the origins of the PIA come from the very first uh, Alzheimer's Imaging Consortium Day. So uh, they conceived it in 1996, and the first one, the pre-conference happened in 98. So this will be the 25th year of AIC um, coming around. Um, and, and right now, the way we're organized is we have a pretty dedicated group of uh, executive committee members. Um, so first off, as we talked about before, we have a lot of educational content. So we, we have not one just one educational chair, but also um, the educational trainee who's helping out. And, and last year um, uh, we had Toby Bethauser running the education chair and Tavia Evans, who is our trainee. And it wouldn't have, it was just so much work now. One person couldn't have done it. So they both did a, a great job um, helping to organize all the, all the content we delivered. Uh, we have three at-large members. So we have a senior scientist, a junior scientist and a trainee committee member. And finally, we have a communications chair and a vice chair our actual chair and our immediate past chair. So uh, most of those terms are for one year, but as I mentioned earlier, when you're elected to the educational chair, you move on to the vice chair next year and the chair after that. Um, and it seemed a little daunting at the beginning, but it's it's a really fun group to be around. We meet you know, once a month, we get a lot done uh, through the DeLeon, through AIC, through um, uh, um, our, our, our workshops and the, and the webinars. 
Um, it's been one of the best parts of my job, but we wouldn't get all of that done if it wasn't for the great people at iStar. So we work with Jody a lot and, and Oz, and they've just been so instrumental in helping us get things, all these big, big projects done uh, that we, we, we wouldn't be able to without their, their excellent uh, support. I completely second that. I'm really new to the executive committee, but it's amazing kind of how Jody and like Oz are able to just split themselves between everything. And they just seem to know everything that's going on. I know they might come to like the vascular cognitive disorders peer meetings and have just been at like the neuroimaging one. And they're just so, so on it. And it's, it's so, so great. And I think speaking from every peer, I'm sure everyone is very thankful and appreciative of all the work that they do for all the peers. Um, so kind of going to be bringing on to AAIC this year. So um, what does your peer kind of have planned? Um, what are the, the aims for the year? Because I know we all have aims and kind of things we want to achieve. Um, and is the peer doing anything at AAIC? Yeah, <laughs> we have quite a lot planned at AIC. Uh, so much so that I'm very much looking forward to the vacation after AIC is over uh, that I have planned. Um, uh, so, so starting off, we have uh, the getting started with neuroimaging analysis uh, immersive workshop. So that's on Friday the 14th of July. Uh, we've done that for 40 members this year. We're, we're a little bit, um, it's very heavily interactive, both with the computers and with the facilitators. So um, we'd like to roll it out to more people, but in terms of like the network that's required and the, the human time that's required, 40 is a really... I think a good number. Um, so it's sold out. We've got a waiting list. So hopefully we'll be able to do some similar activities like that in the future. Uh, and then on, on Saturday, we have the big Alzheimer Imaging Consortium pre-conference. So um, we've, we've thought a lot uh, since restarting the AIC since the pandemic, how to make it, you know, worth people attending so that they feel like they're getting something different than what they're just going to see in, in AIFC. So um, starting off, we have our a uh, traditional what have we learned the year in review uh, talk. So that looks at all the imaging, uh, neuroimaging papers in Alzheimer's disease uh, and related dementia research uh, over the past year. And this year, Indira Attorney from Columbia is going to be giving that. So we're looking forward to that. It's always the highlight, one of the highlights for me of AIC because um, everybody just does such an excellent job on it. And, and when you see the whole year kind of put into the context of these big themes, you see just how many great discoveries have been made um, along the way. Um, uh, we'll have one plenary uh, given by Liana Pastelova this year. So she is going to tell us all about uh, the progress that the iLead study has been making, sort of this really large um, multi-site early onset AD and, and, and uh, atypical AD um, study that's going on, kind of similar in, in vibes to Diane and Adney and Jen Phoebe, sort of big multi-site uh, initiatives to collect a, a, enough data to really make sure we can um, can characterize these diseases well. Um, we'll have sessions on microstructural imaging, on imaging neuroinflammation, imaging genetics, and we'll also have a data blitz. Uh, so that's where our um, PhD students and, and earlier career representative, uh, early career researchers will be um, presenting. Uh, there's a, a mentoring session at lunch. So we have some really uh, excellent um, uh, mentors in the field who are going to sit down with four or five people and just have a, a chat and, and talk about their careers and, and help help people um, who are who are newer in the field um, think about where they want to go um, in the in the near future. Um, since we've done that mentoring lunch session, we, I think we were all frustrated by how people would have to like wolf down their lunch and then run to their poster to, to do a very quick poster session. So we've given a really nice expanded poster session in the afternoon. I think it's about 75 minutes. So we have um, a bit more time for people to really investigate uh, the, the posters and, and, and interact with people at their posters. So, you know, especially all those people who put all their hard time into making those posters letting them really have a chance to, to present their findings and stuff is, is important. Um, and then at the end of the day, it's gonna have a really exciting uh, panel discussion on the role of brain imaging in the era of disease modifying treatment. So this is um, gonna have uh, uh, Philip Shelton's, uh, Toby How Bethauser, and Michael, Michael Ewers doing the, um, the pan uh, being the moderators, but our panelists include uh, Oscar Hansen, Gil Rabinovich, uh, Risa Sperling, John Schott, 
we have a, a really good group of, of people talking about just what it means now that we have approved drugs. What is the role imaging is going to play? Are we ready to deliver the, the imaging needed to deliver these therapies? Things like that. So all the imaging related aspects of, you know, the recent results with Aketamab and Donanumab. And then finally, as I said, uh, we're going to be doing our uh, Moni de Leon award ceremony. Uh, so for the best prize, the best papers, we'll also be giving out the, the best oral uh, talk at AIC and the best poster talk. And uh, we have a couple guest stars coming for that award ceremony, um, which, which I'm excited on. And then after we have a chance to breathe and get into the actual <laughs> start of AIC, um, we have a featured research session on the role of neuroimaging in the, in the area of anti-analyte therapy. So again, talking about um, sort of where imaging, so kind of expanding upon the panel discussion, what are the opportunities for imaging uh, in research and, and, and clinical uh, practice? Uh, and that's going to be happening on Wednesday, the 19th of uh, July. So ha have a couple of days where you can do some non-imaging stuff if you want to find out more about that and then um, come back to us for the FRS. Wow, you are definitely going to need a holiday after that. Um, I was just like, you just kept coming with it. That's, that's so cool. I think it just shows kind of what an active peer you are. Um, so that's super exciting. Um, I'm really sad that I'm not going this year. I feel like I would have loved some of those oh, things. No. Yeah, yeah, I know, sad. But I've been to a couple of conferences, so I, I can't complain. Um, but will you be presenting anything at all? Yeah, so I'll be uh, presenting at the FRS. So it's kind of a... Um, a st my remit was to talk about when trajectories are uh, deviating from abnormal. So thinking about all the elements that go into that, you know, if we're talking about, uh, you know, PET, obviously that deviates much earlier than, than some of the structural MRI measures. Uh, but also, you know, the heterogeneity that can arise. And, and one thing in particular is, you know, in preclinical AD, you know, vascular factors are a really interesting half independent, half part of the disease kind of, of process. So um, you can't really talk about deviating from normal unless you kind of have a better understanding of what normal is and how variable, how variable normal is itself. So thinking about what just we mean by trajectories deviating for, from a normal range. Well, everyone, if you're listening, uh, don't forget to go and see Dave at the Focus Research session. Um, so unfortunately, it's nearly time for the end, but I do have one final question. Um, so why should all of our listeners sign up to your peer? I would say that, you know, imaging's been at the heart of many discoveries in dementia research over the past 20 years, and it's not slowing down because we have new techniques, new modalities, lots of new directions to explore, new populations to explore them in, you know, so that we're finally getting... Um, data in, in people who have been overlooked in the past um, is, is really important. Um, and so as a result, I'd say with, with virtually every other PIA or every other research that people are interested in, there's some sort of neuroimaging related aspect that would be interesting to explore as part of your research. And finally, you know, something you mentioned earlier about, you know, summarizing these things and trying to mask out the variability. I mean, these are beautiful images. Don't just look at a number coming out of the spreadsheet or report. Just assume, oh, that's free server. That's just a number that I, I don't need to understand. It, look at these images. Really see what they have to offer because there's a lot more than just, just a single number. And so I think uh, understanding a bit more about what the images can and can't do and, and what they're really saying about the disease is, is important. And kind of what, like, I'm an ECR, so I guess I'm trying to see it from an ECR point of view. What do you think that... ECRs can gain from joining your PA? Well, I think um, they can gain so, so a lot of additional resources to find out how to do uh, imaging. So, you know, PhD students at big institutions probably have a lot of experts in the field that they can they lean on a, a whole lab infrastructure. Um, but we know that's not the case for probably a majority of the institutions out there. And um, compounded by people who are postdocs who, who don't have the sort of traditional channels of learning that may be offered to PhD students. Um, providing sort of ways of, of getting into this data and not having to, to learn it all yourself is, is, I think, one area that we think is really useful. And, and to access people who are doing this. The one thing I was really um, heartened by was last year when we restarted the AIC, just how excited everybody was to see each other again and what a community 
and I think, you know, it, from my biased viewpoint, um, a, um, a, a rather tight knit inclusive community it is so that people are really excited to, to see each other, talk about their research, talk about their findings, get, get along well with each other. But you can pick up a lot of skills. So, you know, if even if it's just learning how to interact with the command line, that's an important skill that can take you a lot of ways. But, um, you know, with the opportunity to, to do a lot of imaging now in, in Python and R, if you want to learn more about data science, learn more about uh, statistical um, analysis and some of the interesting um, statistical challenges that imaging throws out at you, those skills can be applied in lots of different directions. So we see a lot of um, genetic analysis come to imaging, a lot of imaging analysis go to other techniques and, and uh, places there. So um, you're not just learning how to do one thing that puts you in a dead end, you're, you're opening up a whole new uh, area of skills that, that can help you, no matter if you stay in dementia research or, or you move on to other different fields. That sounds awesome. I think it really, you really just kind of showcased all the exciting things that your peer are doing, um, how exciting it is for the ECRs um, and all the skills that they can gain from it. Um, and I guess these days in research, you, you can't really just do one thing. And I guess that's kind of what your peer is, is looking into. Um, you're, you're giving people the, the opportunities to be able to learn some of those really technical and really hard um, analysis pipelines. Um, so that's super exciting. Um, but thank you so much, Dave, um, for taking the time to join us today. Um, and thank it's you been so an much. It's absolute pleasure. Thanks so much. Yeah, no, I've really enjoyed it. Um, and thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, so you can find profiles on myself, Beth, and my brilliant guest, um, and information on how to become involved in the in ISTAR on our website at the Dementia Researcher .uk, and also at um, the Alzheimer's .org ISTAR. Um, so again, I'm just Beth, I'm Beth, and you've been listening to the Relay Podcast from Dementia Researcher and the Alzheimer's Association. Um, so you make sure you hit subscribe on YouTube or your favourite podcast app to ensure you don't miss any episodes. Thank you very much. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK, Alzheimer's Society, Race Against Dementia and the Alzheimer's Association bringing you research, news, career tips and support.